Hi, I'm here to give you those uh, last uh, lectures about cell signaling. I'll start with the first cell signaling lecture that we had in class and with that I'm going to discuss right some of the molecules that are important for uh, causing the signal, the extracellular actual molecules that cause signaling, and then we'll start talking about the downstream ac actions that those extracellular signals cause. So what we're talking about is the communication of one cell to another cell. And that can either be uh, occurring at a very local level. Cells can secrete molecules that activate themselves, so in an autocrine fashion, or they can secrete molecules that will act far, act far distances away from uh, themselves. So beta, beta cells of the pancreas secrete insulin in response to glucose that's in the blood and that insulin will be uh, dumped into the bloodstream and that action can occur, uh, the insulin binding to fat and muscle cells can occur very very far away from the pancreas and, and so those are far acting kinds of signals. Uh, the signals that we specifically discussed in class were kinases, those are uh, proteins that cause phosphorylation of other molecules and there were several different kinds of kinases we talked about. We talked about receptor tyrosine kinases. Um, tyrosine kinases obviously end up phosphorylating tyrosine residues on the hydroxyl. There are serine threonine kinases such as the MAP kinases, those are all serine threonine kinases phosphorylating the hydroxyls on serine or threonine. Um, just as kinases can phosphorylate and cause the activation of molecules, you can also have phosphates being removed that could cause activation or turning off signals. So phosphatases will remove phosphate groups. And then the last one uh, that we talked about sort of in some depth was GTP binding proteins. We talked about a lot of different GTP binding proteins. Some of those are GTPases, and GTPases such as large G proteins or 7-pass transmembrane proteins, those use the activation of a protein by binding GTP and they regulate the activity by the binding and hydrolysis cycle of GTP on that protein. So we're going to talk both about the, the molecules that bind to receptors that cause signaling as well as the downstream signals that occur following protein binding. Next slide. All right, so let's talk about target proteins. What are we trying to do? In, in cells, when we turn on signals, right, some of those signals may me, may need to be immediate signals that, that cause something to happen right now. So the examples that I gave you were the, the neutrophil that was chasing down the bacteria and polymerizing actin. That cell, the neutrophil cell, is receiving signals from the bacteria. The bacteria is shedding LPS and there's a receptor for LPS on the neutrophil that's causing the polymerization of actin, specifically at the sites where the LPS is binding. There are also signals such as insulin binding that virtually results in an immediate response on fat and muscle cells to upregulate the expression of GLUT4 on the cell surface to remove the high levels of glucose that are now found in the bloodstream. Whereas there are also other signals which take a much longer time for action. Things that turn on gene regulation, turning on gene transcription, uh, going from making a pre-mRNA to, to making an mRNA molecule that then has to be exported out of the nucleus, meet up with ribosomes for the process of translation, possibly be taken to the ER for co-translational import depending on whether this protein is a soluble protein or a transmembrane protein. All of that is going to take way more time to occur and so you can just imagine those sorts of responses such as turning on a cell's uh, regulation to, to grow and divide. That takes quite some time. So depending on what the intracellular targets are of the extracellular signal, you're going to have different processes occur. That can be upregulating or changing metabolism, altering gene expression, altering the shape or, or activity of the cell, and all of that right, is regulated by these signals. Uh, we did talk a little bit about different kinds of signals and where do those signals come from. So we're, we're in general talking about signals that many of the signals are made by cells and cells can then secrete those signals through the process of exocytosis. 
So that's what happens with insulin, right? Insulin is made in the beta cell of the pancreas and it is made as a soluble protein that is made in the ER and gets transported through the exocytic pathway from the ER to the ergot to the Golgi out to the plasma membrane and it's dumped out at the plasma membrane as a soluble protein. Right? Some of the molecules that are signals are made inside of cells and can diffuse out of cells, such as gases. The one that we discussed in class was the generation of nitric oxide due to the uh, processing of arginine into citrulline. You have the process that results in the formation of nitric oxide gas. That nitric oxide gas, which was made in an endothelial cell, can diffuse out of the endothelial cell and act on cells that surround those endothelial cells. And then we have some signals that actually are signals that are bound to a cell. They don't ever get released from that cell. And those signals can only act at short distances by interacting with other cells. So let's talk about what those signals can be. These signals can be virtually anything. They can be proteins, they can be glycoproteins, they can be peptides, amino acids, nucleotides, gases, virtually anything you can think of. And this is where I'm talking about so the different kinds of signaling. You can have short distance signaling, you can have long distance signaling. We call paracrine signaling. So paracrine, para means right, near, right? So when we talk about para, uh, paracrine signaling, we're talking about acting over a very short distance. And you can imagine that if a molecule can only act at a short distance, it's not going to last long. We, don't, we can turn it on and we only up, want to upregulate it for a short amount of time. And these signals are degraded really rapidly. So gases are one of these. Gases don't last very long in the extracellular environment. They're going to be degraded and, and turned over really rapidly. So they can only act at very local places close to the cell. This picture is showing you a signal right? that's on a, on a cell, so the target cell binds to a membrane-bound signal, and then that can cause extra signaling, but the signaling is only going to occur at molecules that are very close to that original signaling molecule. Okay, So contact-dependent and paracrine signaling, that's all very close distance signaling. Very different than the endocrine signaling that I told you about, right? Hormones get secreted into the bloodstream, can act very far away, uh, and neurons also can do far-acting uh, responses. It's interesting, neurons sort of have both close and far-acting reaches because neurons can be really, really long. You can have a neuron that extends from your spinal column all the way down to the tip of your toe, so it could be virtually three feet long. So the signal actually occurs at the uh, junction of the neuron that's leading out of your spinal column. And so that signal is then transmitted to three feet away. But neurons can also have very locally acting signals because at the very end of that neuron, you're going to have a secretion of a neurotransmitter which can act on a target cell. So neurons are a little bit of a tricky circumstance and I probably won't ask too much about that on an exam. All right, getting to this concept of signals and how they all get integrated, you know, this is very, very difficult to understand. I am still in awe of how our body works. Each cell can, can integrate signals and generate the appropriate response. What is appropriate? How does the cell know what is appropriate? I have no idea, but the cell knows, all right? It, see, it receives multiple signals, and depending on what cell type you have, right? So here they're showing you whatever the blue nuclei in, in the cell on the left receive signals A, B, and C. That might mean survive. It receives A, B, C with another two signals, D and E. That might not just mean survive, but divide. Uh, instead of D and E, if it gets F and G, it might say, hey, not only do I want you to survive, but I want you to differentiate into a different kind of cell. So that happens a lot during development. And right, depending on the cell, if it gets no signals, sometimes that means, okay, then you, you know, if there's no signals around, you're not necessary. That happens a lot in the immune system. Um, if you take 485, you're really going to see how these signals start to become integrated. Okay, and just to be clear, Okay. It's a little bit crazy because depending on what cell type you're talking about, A, B, and C can signal survival in one kind of cell, but A, B, and C could signal death in another kind of cell. Each cell is different. 
the cells are going to have receptors that, that integrate the signal and cause an intracellular signaling cascade, and that intracellular signaling cascade can be different for each different cell type. All right, let's start by talking about nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a gas that can be diffused through membranes. It can very easily pass from one cell to another. And nitric oxide has a huge role in the immune re response, but it also plays a role in smooth muscle contraction. We talked about this in uh, the context of how smooth muscle cell, like the uh, heart, right, is it requires it for beating. But you also need smooth muscle contractions for the for your blood to flow. So uh, our our blood vessels are surrounded, right? So blood vessels are made out of endothelial cells with the apical side facing the lumen. So the apical side is in contact with the blood, whereas the basolateral sides face the outside. And that basolateral side, right? So our blood vessels are actually pretty elastic, right? They can be shrunk, all right, or they can be expanded depending on the circumstances. And the shrinking and expanding is due to smooth muscle that surrounds the blood vessels. Right, so you can imagine, okay, when you constrict a blood vessel, what happens to your to your blood pressure? Your blood pressure goes up. You have a smaller space. The fluid going through is actually has to go through at a faster rate, so your blood pressure has to be increased. That happens when you're nervous, when you're afraid, right? When you're very relaxed, okay, your blood vessels dilate. That can cause huge problems in and of itself, right? If you have dilation of your blood vessels, your blood pressure drops, and it's very easy when your blood pressure drops to faint or actually go into cardiac arrest because you just start stop the beating of the heart. All right, nitric oxide, all right, it's made from arginine by a nitric oxide synthase, and nitric oxide synthase acts on arginine and one of the byproducts in the presence of oxygen is to create this nitric oxide in the and the final product is citrulline. I, I don't really care that you know that, but I just want you to understand that uh, amino acids play a role in this. So the nitric oxide synthase acts on arginine to generate nitric oxide. This happens in endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells that are surrounding your blood vessels can generate nitric oxide when the nerve terminal of a motor neuron uh, reaches the endothelial cells and it secretes a, a, neuro, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to an acetylcholine receptor that then activates the nitric oxide synthase inside the endothelial cell and the nitric oxide in the endothelial cell can then diffuse out. And that's where we find the nitric oxide then can diffuse into a smooth muscle cell. And inside that smooth muscle cell, the nitric oxide binds to a guanylyl cyclase. And the guanylyl cyclase causes the generation of cyclic GMP from GTP. So GTP is just a natural product that's in the cytosol of all of your cells. It, it's a form of energy, uh, right? We've seen GTP bind to multiple pro, uh, proteins. We've seen a uh, large variety of GTPases that utilize GTP as a signal. And in this case, what we're doing is we're taking that nucleotide and we're actually making a cyclic molecule, which then has downstream functions to to cause smooth muscle relaxation. So increased levels of cyclic GMP result in smooth muscle relaxation. And that process right, then allows for the opening of blood vessels. Okay, we talked a lot about this right, in the context of what happens when people are having a heart attack. Right? When people are having a heart attack, their heart, their smooth muscle is often contracted. And what we want to do is we want to relax that uh, contraction. And so people are given nitroglycerin. So they put that nitroglycerin, it's a little tablet, they put it under your tongue, and it Im virtually immediately generates nitric oxide. The nitric oxide can then get into your bloodstream, travel very short distances, and, and cause um, smooth muscle relaxation thereby reducing the pressure that's being caused in your heart. We also talked about this with Viagra. Viagra is a male enhancement uh, drug, right? It, it allows for a man to take Viagra, and Viagra actually inhibits 
the phosphodiesterase, which would take cyclic GMP and turn it back into GMP. By inhibiting phosphodiesterase, any activation of the cyclic GMP, okay, so the man still has to be able to activate the cyclic GMP production, right, by getting a thought in his head and having that happen, right, but by inhibiting the phosphodiesterase activity, the cyclic GMP builds up, causes smooth muscle relaxation, causing additional blood flow, which then allows for this male enhancement. So smooth muscle is regulated, right, this is just one way to regulate smooth muscle through the activities of both nitric oxide synthase, which is found in endothelial cells, and by guanonyl cyclase, which leads to the production of cyclic GMP. Okay, so the next set of molecules that we talked about as far as signaling goes were hormones. And I talked about several different kinds of hormones, uh, and we didn't really talk in any depth about uh, signaling by any hormone other than by insulin. So we're just going to talk a little bit about the different kinds of hormones we have. There's steroid hormones. Steroid hormones are the hormones that look like cholesterol, and steroid hormones can cross membranes freely, just as cholesterol is part of your membrane. So this, these are molecules that can get into the cell and act intracellularly without needing uh, an active transport mechanism. So there's cortisol, estradiol, testosterone. There's several several of these. All right, well, you know about some of these sex hormones, right? So testosterone, estradiol, those are the things that can cross membranes and cause trans gene transcription to be turned on. All right, another one of the hormones that we don't talk about uh, very much, uh, thyroxine, that's a, a hormone that's made from if you look at the structure of it, right, the structure is really the amino acid tyrosine, but it has an extra phenylalanine group added to it. So now it's thyroxine. And thyroxine is the hormone that's important for your thyroid function. So you get T3 and T4, and those T3 and T4 molecules are important for, they're made by the thyroid, and they play a role in your metabolism. So your metabolism is absolutely dependent upon the formation of T3 and T4. You can have hormones that cross membranes. So in this case, they're showing you an androgen receptor. An androgen receptor is going to bind to a, a steroid type hormone. And the steroid type hormone, when it binds, DHT is actually a form of testosterone, dihydroxytesterone. When it binds, it causes the translocation of the um, androgen receptor into the nucleus. And once that androgen receptor gets into the nucleus, it causes a, a change in gene transcription. So you see the androgen receptor is bound to the promoter sequence, the promoter and the enhancer sequence upstream, and it could either be upstream or downstream <coughs> promoter sequences Promoter sequences are upstream, enhancer sequences can be anywhere. But that activates the gene transcription that's associated with testosterone in this case. So hormones, right, can really do uh, very similar things to other types of uh, molecules such as gases that can freely diffuse across membranes.